Okay, everyone, welcome to July 23rd, 2019 replacement lecture for International Politics and Drugs. This section of July 23rd's lecture deals with our case study of La Familia Michoacan, which is one of the most important drug trafficking cartels in modern Mexico. The the centerpiece of this analysis is going to base itself on the puzzle posed by Kostelnik and Skarbek. So what is the puzzle that Kostelnik and Skarbek, the authors, hope to approach here? What is the thing they see as being incongruent or needing an explanation? Well, they know that La Familia Michoacan is famous for gruesome violence and it has spent a lot of time building up this gangland reputation for extreme violence. But at the same time, it provides lots of charity and service provision and bills itself as an intensely moral organization. So we know from our state and mafia lectures that lots of governments do the same thing, right? States use violence, they put people in jail. Sometimes they do so unfairly and purposefully unfairly at the same time that they're providing services. Um, but the hypocrisy here seems extremely evident, right? There's, there's really no getting around the fact that La Familia Michoacan is a brutal organization. So what does the charity and service provision do, or rather how does it function to provide returns to La Familia Michoacan? The theory here basically posits that drug trafficking cartels like La Familia have a handful of problems um, in the way that we discussed mafias with Gambetta, a mafioso managing multiple different sided games at the same time, needing to choose individual behaviors that maximize their returns from all of the parties in the games that they play. Kostelnik and Skarbek argue that drug trafficking organizations find themselves in much the same position. There are four related problems, all of which by this point should be at least passingly familiar to us. The first is that there are no legal institutions to manage market coordination. It's extremely difficult for drug cartels to manage their own internal principal agent problems, and even more difficult for them to manage cooperation with their competitors in a way that builds a non-violent or constructive market. Second, they need to manage interdiction efforts by the state, right? Of course, the police are always coming for you. Third, because there are no market institutions and because the state is attempting to interdict against you, it's important to have the hearts and minds of the communities in which the cartel operates. It's very easy to alienate these communities. And then lastly, the familiar problem of member defection. So how can the cartel manage all of these problems at the same time? Kostelnik and Skarbek identify two themes in La Familia's action plan. The first has to do with their organizational strategy. Does this look like hierarchy or like networking? Obviously, um, in sort of the same way that we saw in Levitt and Venkatesh's case study of the Southside Chicago gang, there are elements of both. We have firewalls put in to cap how well the state can follow trails of evidence between levels and functions, but there does appear to be management direction. Um, in particular, this top part of the organization seems very well firewalled. The drug trafficking organization's leaders those that have connections to um, legitimate business people and legitimate government officials are probably pretty well fenced off from the operations, the day-to-day -day operations of the cartel. But then you have these sort of middle managers who appear to, in this case, manage the work of multiple plaza chiefs, which I think looks to me like the local, um, the local leaders from our uh, from our Levitt and Venkatesh reading. Um, and then we have, you know, several other functions that report to our middle manager. And then these plaza chiefs manage plaza operatives, the actual drug distributors, and 
those jobs are probably needed out into sort of accounting enforcement and logistical roles, I, I would suspect, that we saw in Lebanon Bangladesh. Okay, so where's the most dangerous place to be? Where are you most likely to be attacked by a rival or by the police? I think the obvious answer here is the middle manager, right? If we if we believe Shapiro that every communication is an opportunity to interdict, then most communications in this org chart lead to the middle manager, which means that the middle manager has the most exposure to being found out, uh, being traced through some loose end the organization leaves lying around. And so that's probably the worst place to be. It's interesting to note that Kostelnik and Skarbek argue that these organizations emerge and become powerful when some shock erodes state power. Um, they compare this to the rise of organized crime in Russia, or use the rise of organized crime in Russia as an example. And that being said, um, and also noticing that David Skarbek, one of the co-authors of this article, was also the author of the Mexican Mafia piece that we read earlier in the semester, it's interesting to note that the assumption about drug trafficking cartels organizational behavior here is a corporatist one. We're not talking about a drug cartel that operates like a state that just provides protection. Um, the assumption that they seem to be using is the assumption that this is a directed supply chain that looks more like a corporation than like a state. But these supply chains and the way that they're governed emerge to fill in the cracks of a state that is receding. Okay, the second um, theme that Kostelnik and Skarbek explore is La Familia's religious overtones. La Familia uses a strange blend of evangelical Christianity and repurposed folk saints designed to incorporate indigenous cultures and create this intricate mortality, uh, more mortality, that too, I suppose, morality and mystique. And what you're seeing here is uh, Santa Muerte, the saint of death, who has been adopted as the patron saint of La Familia. There's sort of a cult worship around the death saint, um, who obviously is not officially a member of the Catholic canon. So how are these strategies used to manage problems? Uh, the, the most detailed treatment we get in Kostelnik and Skarbek and in the supplemental readings has to do with facilitating internal coordination that is managing principal agent problems. Well, the first is that we have an onerous indoctrination process, right? Um, lots and lots of work goes into becoming a family member, including the indoctrination into this religion. And who should this remind us of? Hopefully you've mentioned uh, Berman's piece on why religious radicals make better terrorists. Here we have more Berman. We create club goods for successful recruits. Uh, the most important club good that La Familia creates is protection. Uh, many people who are from marginal backgrounds join La Familia and participate in the drug trafficking because members of the family get protection from outside threats. What does this say, by the way, about La Familia's incentives to actually maintain good order, right? We, one, of the, one of the puzzles that we're confronting here is the idea that La Familia creates public order, they create public goods, they give money to charity, they make the sales pitch that they are good for society. But if they are recruiting people, who are living lives in danger, do they really want to mitigate the chaos in some of these developing areas? Kostelnik and Skar Skarbek argued that no, um, they'd actually rather have chaos so that they can create stability as a club good and invite people in in order to receive it and only provide stability to those who have um, who've pledged into the family. Another strategy to manage the principal agent problem here is that many, many of the people who are recruited into La Familia are former addicts or people who are deeply, deeply impoverished. Why would you do this? 
So one of the obvious answers is loyalty, right? We discussed this um, most recently in uh, in our discussion of uh, Levitt and Venkatesh. But it's not just loyalty, right? There's a sense that you can tear these people down and rebuild them psychologically. And in fact, La Familia run rehab facilities where, according to Finnegan, they destroy personalities and turn these people into obedient soldiers. There are some, some pieces of testimony from poor folks about the attraction of cartel life. You find young people who have very little prospects, and um, you brainwash them into the idea that this actually does function as a family, that employment works as a family. Here in the United States, where we have a, you know, a robust job market most of the time, it's unusual to think about your employers as family. Uh, the employer wants you to think about your, your job as family, but that's you know, mostly so that they can pay you less. Well, here La Familia really attempts to make this sales pitch to poor kids, and it seems to work. Of course, it's not all hood rats, right? In, in class, we discuss the strategy of recruiting good students and sending them to business schools and computer science programs and law schools so that they can come back and provide services that are lacking in Mexico. Um, in addition to the recruitment strategy, La Familia imposes really strict punishments, often death, for those who defect or quit from the organization. And the strategy here sort of speaks for itself, right? In order to manage defection, one thing you can do is promise to kill people who are part of the family. And you'll notice that doing so doesn't really alienate the community because these people were already in the game. It doesn't really attract police attention, particularly in a state where there's a lot of drug violence already because these people were already in the game. Um, so you're not the beauty of the strategy of punishing people who defect or quit is that you're not trading anything off. So rather than um, moving on, I guess, from the principal agent problem, when we talk about external cooperation in this course so far, we've mostly dealt with the problem of coordinating or cooperating peaceful markets between drug cartels. But that's not really what Kostelnik and Scarbeck are interested in. Kostelnik and Scarbeck are mostly interested in communities and the relationship between La Familia and the community. Why would communities resist La Familia? I mean, this is an obvious question. Well, of course, the community has an incentive to resist La Familia because the group um, integrates into communities in order to extort them in order to abuse them, in order to recruit kids, and it draws to it drug-related violence. So the communities understand that these groups are pernicious and are likely to have deleterious effects on community life. So in order to combat this perception, what does La Familia do? Well, they organize both private and public goods. In certain circumstances, they create public goods the whole community can share in. Um, and in other circumstances, they invite people in selectively, important people that they see as being linchpins to building the community's broader support. Um, and they invite them in in exchange for private goods. But despite all of this, they still abuse civilians. They show up in these places and they abuse civilians. So what is the strategy in order to make sure that these problems don't get pinned on, um, don't get pinned on La Familia. Right here we see that the Caballeros Templarios, uh, uh, the Knights Templar, a, a gang that split off from La Familia Michoacan, which we'll sort of pretend is the same as La Familia for the purposes of this case. Um, they engage in propaganda that attempts to transform their cartel into a social movement. This is similar to not only the, the organizations that we're sort of all familiar with in Colombia, but also we'll see similar to the social movement theology that's used to manage public perception of smuggling gangs in Mali. The Knights Templar criticize the federal police. They say that they fail to protect the people of Michoacan against incursions from alternate drug gangs. 
And they also blame the police when the cartel murders someone that's broadly perceived to be innocent. So they blame the police when a civilian dies and attempt to shift blame for their own violence to the state, which is, of course, not very hard because the state is often acting in a corrupt manner in the first place. They posit themselves as a working man's organization. They export drugs and the problems of drugs to the United States. This is another reason that they prohibit local drug sales. They try and make sure that their agents don't uh, sell drugs locally. So in what types of places would La Familia's strategy of providing public goods and pinning blame for violence on the state work? In lawless areas, places where any order is better than no order. What does a weak state mean and what opportunities does the presence of a weak state afford organizations like La Familia? Well, the first thing that we might look to in a place like Mexico is corrupt or abusive policing. If the citizens feel they can't get a fair deal from the state, if this is true, what would we expect people in La Familia held areas to say? We'd expect them to say that they're afraid of the police or that they think that the police are useless. And in fact, they do. It can be hard to tell whether this is because the state is really weak or because La Familia invests in making them seem so, right? So when we think about the patterns of violence that a cartel like La Familia might um, engage in or create, what we should be looking for are the types of attacks that make the police look hapless, that make it seem like they can't protect you from a stronger actor. This draws people in and makes them believe that they're better off seeking the protection of La Familia in a club or private good way, as opposed to relying on the public goods that are provided by the police. Weak states also provide few services. So if, LL, if uh, La Familia sees the value in supplanting the state service provision, if they think that they can get something out of providing these services, then we might expect that they will. And they do. Um, there are lots and lots of examples of La Familia providing what appear to be public services or even club goods that benefit wide groups of their constituents. These services include protection, which is provided at a fee and probably in exchange for loyalty, uh, similar to the way that we see mafias that are interested in offering genuine protection to their clients and need to gather intelligence. La Familia makes the sales pitch that in order to be protected by the family, you need to provide it with lots of information about your life, otherwise their protection is not going to be as valuable. And in the same way that Scott argued that the way that we provide our information to the state in order to receive services is a double-edged sword that both allows the state to provide services and to enforce against us when we buck their their intentions to socially uh, to engineer social outcomes so too does la familia use the information provided to it by its willing customers to enforce against them and this particularly occurs when la familia oversteps its bounds when they violate the trust of the communities they then use the information they have to make it sound as though um, these people are really under the thumb of la familia and would be better off just accepting even this injustice. Part of providing protection requires that you police your own membership, right? So this is why we see La Familia having these strict codes of conduct among its members. No drug use, no drug sales in Mexican territory, um, these sorts of things. La Familia also sells itself as being local and bills the government as being some type of clueless invaders. Now, do locals necessarily believe that La Familia is providing consistent services? Think about the story of Don Miguel's rancho uh, from Finnegan's article. Don Miguel um, owns the ranch. The, the ownership of the ranch is contested between Don Miguel and his brother-in-law. And Don Miguel receives ownership of the ranch from El Gato, a local La Familia member. But what does Don Miguel worry about when El Gato is killed or replaced? 
or maybe his brother-in-law will be able to come back and appeal to the new La Familia representative about the decision, and his ranch, um, his ownership of the ranch will later get overturned. So there is a lot of evidence in these articles that people suspect that the, the order that La Familia provides is not as efficient, is not as public, is not as beneficial as what could be provided by a fully consolidated and fair state. All in all, how does this strategy work? How well is La Familia doing? Well, people turn out to protest in La Familia's favor when the state cracks down. They say all of the sorts of things we might expect if they appreciate a Robin Hood type. Is this the only example in popular culture of a drug cartel that is capable of inspiring loyalty through service? Those of you that have spent any amount of time thinking or considering these sorts of problems will probably be reminded very quickly of Pablo Escobar, whose organization was famous for building libraries and soccer stadiums and fields and schools uh, in order that the local population would support him in the event of any sort of interdiction. Despite this success, there's a fair amount of evidence that how well La Familia can assuage public doubts varies, right? Some communities don't buy this. Some communities don't accept La Familia, or they accept them less wholeheartedly than others. And understanding why these attitudes change is probably pretty crucial to reducing La Familia's influence in Michoacan. Okay, just as a last issue um, from the readings, what evidence did you see about network versus hierarchy? To what extent are we simply mitigating our principal agent problems using the technologies that are available for legal businesses when they organize their corporations? Well, one thing that jumped out at me is that you have a lot of drugs happening here. Um, different drugs coming from a variety of different places. It seems strange to believe that a networked organization could be given credit for directing all of this, right? There must be some central management that is somehow directing the sale and movement of all of these different types of drugs. This, to me, makes it sound like La Familia is maybe more hierarchical than networked. It does, however, seem a little bit multi-tiered, right? Almost like a gang organization from Levitt or Vankatesh. It's interesting that El Chayo, in this example, is part landlord, right? He has jobs that are outside of La Familia. Um, and much of what he does has to do with extorting or providing protection to local businesses. So not only is there a little bit of leeway here in terms of how this multi-tiered organization might um, function as part network and part hierarchy, it also seems to straddle the line in some ways between corporation and state. Um, and this is sort of a tension that we will see often, or that you will see often if you spend more time reading into these sorts of cartels. Okay, that is all that I have on La Familia Michoacan. There are still a couple of lectures coming for June 25th, and we'll take a look at the interrelationship between insurgency and drug cartels, first in the case of the Sendero Luminoso in Peru, and then we'll take a look at the ecosystem of violence in northern Mali and the Islamic Maghreb.